Welcome back to Conflicts of Interest. This is episode 337. I'm the host, Kyle Anzalone. A lot to talk about on today's show, so I'm going to get into the news quickly. Just want to remind people they could share the show from the Libertarian Institute, where I'm the news editor, or find on the blog at antiwar.com, where I'm the opinion editor. You can support the show by subscribing either wherever you listen to audio podcasts or youtube rumble and odyssey is where you can find the video version of the show on twitter the the show account is at con underscore interest i'm at kyle Lamslone underscore and you can help the show by uh purchasing cbd from our sponsor paloma verde paloma verde cbd.com promo code piece wide selection high quality cbd products last week i recently uh placed an order landed last week i placed an order uh for some new products that i'm looking forward to getting from paloma verde uh for anybody who you know use wants to get some high quality cbd products again just use the promo code p-e-a-c-e at paloma verde cbd.com and you're going to get 20 percent off and the show's going to get kept bad so it's a great way to help out yourself and to help your favorite podcast now let's get into the news first story from uh that i wrote for the libertarian institute and this was october 13th or 14th excuse me must negotiating with pentagon uh on continuing to provide internet for ukraine now this is actually kind of outdated and i'll talk about but i think my article here, you know, tells an important story, and then I'll get into why, you know, essentially what this is is outdated. So, uh, Tesla and C- uh, SpaceX CEO Elon Musk has urged the Democratic uh, Department of Defense to take over funding for the Starlink satellite network in Ukraine, saying his company cannot to shell out hundreds of millions of dollars to provide web services for the war and torn nation. CNN says it obtained documents that show space has requested the Pentagon to foot the bill for Starlink, a collection of low orbit satellites that have allowed Ukrainians to access the internet after Moscow destroyed much of Kiev's ground based internet infrastructure. Space sets will cost over $30 million per month to provide internet to Ukraine, adding the price tag would reach $120 million by the end of 2022 and over $400 million for the next 12 months, according to the CNN report. The documents show the financial burden of supplying Kiev with Starlink, as SpaceX has furnished the country with some 20,000 terminals since the Russian invasion in February. One letter obtained by CNN shows that a high-ranking Ukrainian military official asked for an additional 8,000 Starlink access points in July, but an outside consultant working for SpaceX explained the company could not afford the request. SpaceX faces terribly difficult decisions here. I do not think they had the financial ability to provide any additional terminals or services as requested by uh, the Ukrainian general, the consultant. Wrote. And of course, that consultant is being paid by SpaceX, but. Um, you know, they're probably looking for somebody to kind of voice like, hey, this is a pretty large financial burden. On Thursday, Musk says his company is spending around $20 million per month to maintain Starlink for Kiev, but noted operations were becoming more expensive due to cyber attacks and jamming by Russian forces. Musk also took to Twitter to speculate on the reason of SpaceX's documents being released to CNN, writing, strange that nothing was leaked about our competitors in the Spanish launch communication. Uh, and then he says Lockheed, Bar- Lockheed, Lockheed Martin and Boeing, who get over sixty billion, and he's you know talking about from the Pentagon. There, the CEO suggested the documents may have been leaked by a corrupt official. Wouldn't be surprised to find out this particular individual working for Lockheed or Boeing when he retires from the DoD corruption at its finest. And look, you know, this is something that happens a lot where, you know, uh, people go from within the Pentagon to these defense contractors. Our current uh, Department of Defense head, uh, the Secretary uh, of Defense, Lloyd Austin, formerly worked at Raytheon, uh, but you know, it's much deeper than that. You know, it's these lower level Pentagon officials that go from working with Pentagon acquisitions to working, you know, on the board of Raytheon is a huge leg up to, you know, these companies getting more contracts. Um, 
And look, you know, these, these companies sue each other over, if we look at the, the Jedi contract for the Pentagon cloud computing, they actually renamed this thing now, uh, and it's a whole new thing, because everybody got bogged down in suing the Pentagon and each other over getting that contract, because, you know, there was a, an employee for the Pentagon who was advocating for a model that the Pentagon should pursue, but at the same time was under contract from, I believe... Um, it was Microsoft that he was under contract with at, at the same time. And so, you know, there, there's a lot of lawsuits being traded there. And that whole project was a mess that's been set back probably five years now just by, again, these companies suing each other. So... On Friday, the Department of Defense confirmed it was in talks with Mutt's firm on continuing to provide internet service to Kiev with Pentagon uh, D Deputy Press Secretary Sabrina Singh saying the department has been in communications with SpaceX regarding Starlink. However, it, Singh indicated the Pentagon was looking at other companies. And as, as she said, there are certainly other SATCOM capabilities that exist out there. There's not just space sets. There are other entities that we can certainly partner with when it comes to providing Ukraine with what they need on the battlefield, she added. And, you know, this is a really strange thing to happen, the, the animosity that you see towards Musk here, who has already provided, you know, between 80 and $120 million worth of service for Kiev. And, you know, instantly after Russia invaded Ukraine, uh, space ads, you know, started providing this startling service. And it, it was, I think, one of the, the things, and we'll get into this in the article, that, you know, the Ukrainian officials have said this has been hugely important. And so when you have a project like the F-35 or uh, the, the Zumwalt class of destroyers, the uh, Ford class, the new aircraft carriers, these, these projects are constantly coming in over budget. Uh, you know, they're delayed years, decades. They don't perform up to the initial standards requested and Boeing and Raytheon and Lockheed Martin never have a problem getting paid by the Pentagon and so you know for the Pentagon to be putting kind of up a shield here is interesting we had to imagine it's political um and, and then, you know, Musk adds that it's insanely difficult for low orbit communications constellations to avoid bankruptcy. That was the fate of every company that has tried this before. And, you know, judging by how much it costs space, that's, that, that's probably why. Now, it does seem like uh, somebody pointed out that space that's is requesting more money than it seems like they're currently shelling out for this project and as i as must said that may be the reason you know who knows maybe they're just trying to upcharge the pentagon on this or the hell they probably are uh but it could also be that they, they are anticipating but also uh the infrastructure you know sometimes the cyber attacks actually take out the infrastructure so this thing this stuff could get uh increasingly expensive to replace um all right, so I continue here. Despite providing Ukraine's military with internet services over the past seven months, Musk has come under fire from Kiev and Washington in recent weeks. On October 3rd, the Tesla CEO tweeted a potential peace plan to end the war in Ukraine, proposing a series of compromises for both sides. Kiev's ambassador to Germany responded by telling Musk to fuck off, while Washington Post columnist Matt Boot accused the CEO of spreading Russian propaganda. Additionally, recent web outages near the battlefront of eastern Ukraine have prompted calls for officials to probe some of the uh, some from American politicians. Evidently, the Starlink system is down over the front lines of Ukraine. Must should make a statement about this or should be investigated. This is a national security issue. GOP Congressman Adam Kinzinger wrote on Twitter. And again, you know, if you have failures by any other weapon system, the, the, these companies aren't like raked over the coals by politicians on Twitter. You know, again, this is very unique treatment to Musk. Musk says his space-based internet service is increasingly coming under attack and that Russia is actively trying to kill Starlink. Amid criticisms, however, Ukrainian presidential aide, uh, 
Poldek, uh, I, I'm not, I know I'm not pronouncing his name correctly, has praised SpaceX's efforts. Like it or not, Musk has helped us survive our most critical moments of war. Business has had the right to its own strategies. Ukraine will find solutions to keep Starlink working. We expect that the company will provide stable connection till the end of negotiations, he said on Twitter. Uh, the vice prime minister of Ukraine also observed that Starlink has been uniquely resilient under Russian bombardment, saying that over 100 cruise missile attacks hit Ukrainian energy and communications infrastructure, but with Starlink, we quickly restored connection in critical areas. Starlink continues to be an essential part of critical infrastructure. Now, I think there's maybe one confusion, and I I'm, don't know for certain if this is the case, but it seems that the the Starlink is provided to Ukraine, but that means the Ukrainian government. And so, you know, civilian infrastructures have it. I'm sure, you know, it's helping to run the trains on time and things like that. Uh, but I, I think largely this is being used for the military. And look, if you're just some lady living in Kiev, uh, I saw her exchanging a, a, some, you know, again, some woman saying she lived in Kiev, exchanging a, a Twitter conversation with Musk, and it seemed that she did have to buy you know, a Starlink terminal or whatever before she was able to access the internet. And so it's not that he's, uh, you know, providing internet to the entire country, just to the country's government and military. Now, you know, it, it's worth noting too here that you see the different reaction between Russia and, and you know, the West when it comes to Musk's, uh, peace plan that, that, you know, we talked about this more in the past on the show and everything, but you know, he, he, he tweets it out and Russia, it, there, there's deal breakers. There, there's things in Musk Twitter, uh, you know, Twitter peace plan, which obviously a real peace plan would be much more complicated and, and would take much more negotiation and everything. But there are things in there that cross the Russian red line, but the Kremlin said, Hey, look, you know, anybody who's suggesting peace is moving in a positive direction. And so let's engage in diplomacy where in the West, you know, there, there's things in there again, that Russia doesn't want, but they don't say, Oh, Hey, you know, this guy, Elon Musk, who has been helping to fund the war on the Ukrainian side, uh, you know, to the tune of probably more than any other private civilian in the world, uh, you know, with $120 million, you know, of companies that he owns, their money being poured into this war now, um, you know, he, he tweets out a peace plan and, you know, he's rejected as a Russian agent and propagandist in American media is quite sh shocking. Uh, next up, NATO set to kick off nuclear war games on Monday. Alliance head Jen Stoltenberg says canceling war games would send the wrong signal. I wrote this for antiwar.com on October 14th. The North Atlantic Treaty Organization is set to begin its annual military drills in preparation for nuclear war. American B-52 bombers will be joined by advanced aircraft from other alliance members as they simulate a war of annihilation with Russia. The war games are dubbed Steadfast Noon will begin Monday and run through the end of October. Belgium is hosting the exercises which will take place over the North Sea and United Kingdom. Some American aircraft will take off from bases in North Dakota. According to a NATO press release, Exercise Steadfast Noon involves 14 countries and up to 60 aircraft of various types, including 4th and 5th generation fighter jets as well as surveillance and tanker aircraft. As in previous years, U.S. long-range bombers will take part. It added, as nuclear weapons exist, NATO will remain a nuclear alliance. This year's nuclear drills come as tensions between NATO and Moscow are multi-decade high. Moscow has accused the alliance of waging war against Russia in Ukraine. Washington has uh, led its allies in providing Ukraine with tens of billions in weapons, as well as intelligence and training to kill Russian soldiers in Ukraine. NATO Secretary General Jen Stoltenberg stated it would send the wrong signal to cancel the war games. It would send a very wrong signal if we suddenly now cancel a routine, long-planned exercise because of the war in Ukraine. That would absolutely send the wrong signal. Stoltenberg argued that going through with nuclear war games is the best way to prevent nuclear war. And NATO's firm, predictable behavior, our military strength is the best way to prevent Vent escalation. He continued, if we now create the grounds for any misunderstandings, miscalculations in Moscow, our willingness to protect and defend our allies, we will increase the risk of escalation. As 
Western military support for Ukraine has increased, the Kremlin has issued a warning that it would respond. Recently, Russian President Vladimir Putin said he would defend Russian territory with a full arsenal at his disposal while pushing forward with nuclear war games stoltenberg slammed putin's comments as dangerous and reckless and so you know this this is really just infuriating the the position and the outlook of everything of nato where anytime you bat down not only is that like sending the wrong signal to moscow but they actually believe that it's making nuclear war more likely because if they bat down then russia is more likely to use nukes which is you know absolutely just just insane and backward logic but that's uh, you, you know this is the the routine thinking of nato this is what they believe this is you know why we're at this heightened risk of nuclear war that that we're currently experiencing Next up, an article by Connor Freeman from antiwar.com on October 14th. Connor, of course, the co-host of this show, and he wrote up the latest, another one, a new uh, $725 million arms package for Ukraine. Connor writes, the Joe Biden administration will send $725 million in more weapons and other military equipment to Ukraine, the White House announced on Friday. The arms shipment is expected to contain munitions, including more rounds for the high mobility artillery rocket system HIMARS and military vehicles but no new significant capabilities or counter air defenses. Russia's wide scale bombing across the country has spurred NATO states to provide more weapons which will keep the war going. This brings the total US military aid provided to Ukraine since the war began to 17.5 billion. So far the US has pledged over 67 billion in most in mostly military aid to fund Ukraine during the war. The figure is greater than Russia's entire 2021 military budget. So there's, I think, like 17 to 20 million dollars, billion dollars that the U.S. has sent to Ukraine. And this is, uh, you know, said to help Kiev maintain their government. And I'm sure to some extent, some of this money is going to people who's you know, homes were destroyed by Russian soldiers or they lived in uh, regions now annexed by Russia, but they consider themselves to be Ukrainian and want to live in Ukraine. And, you know, those people likely need assistance and some of the money I'm sure is going there. Uh, but at the same time, there's a lot of money going a lot of other places. And I'm sure a lot of it is going in uh, to the, the corrupt politicians of Kiev. You know, long before this war, it was re regularly recognized that Kiev was one of the most corrupt government in Europe and so to expect that in a, in a situation of war that their accounting would get better not worse that the corruption would get better not worse is just completely ridiculous and so uh, I'm sure a lot of this money is just being stolen additionally the Pentagon says they've sent about 17.5 billion uh, now Congress has approved more and, and everything like that some weapons haven't been sent yet but you know we're now looking at 20 billion dollars of American weapons entering Ukraine in the past seven months this is an extraordinary number. This is the first new arms package announced after Moscow began its major missile and airstrikes against civilian infrastructure, including energy and communication systems. Moscow's escalated air campaign came in response to increased Ukrainian attacks on Russian territory, including a truck bombing on the Kerch Bridge that killed three people. The bombing attached Crimea to Russia, although the U.S. is reluctant to send long-range weapons to Ukraine over concern they could be used to attack Russian territory, both the State Department Department and Pentagon have signed off on attacks against Crimea as well as Russia's newly annexed territories. The new aid fails to understand the president or falls under not fails to understand the new aid falls under the presidential drawdown authority, the PDA, which allows Biden to send weapons directly from U.S. military stockpiles without congressional approval. This is the second PDA shipment during the 2023 fiscal year uh, that begins, I believe, just October 1st. It comes from the stopgap funding bill, which authorized $3.7 billion for the PDA and approximately $16 billion in total aid for Ukraine. Russia now holds approximately 20% of Ukraine and threatens to expand the war as a result of Washington providing longer-range weapons to Kiev, such as HIMARS. The U.S. has sent 16 HIMARS to Kiev and recently approved the provision of additional 18 launchers. The new weapon, 
Ukraine's aid is not expected to include material to def uh, defeat missile attacks like the one seen uh, over the last week. It was designed to bolster Ukraine's ability to beat uh, Russian in counter offensives and has yielded uh, large territorial gains this week, an official told Reuters. The Biden administration recently said they would expedite the delivery of the National Advanced Surface to Air Missile Systems to Ukraine. This announcement comes amid rising tensions over NATO's proxy war. And during meetings of the alliance defense ministers, more arms shipments are being announced by Europe, uh, Europe's uh, NATO members. So European states that are in NATO. Um, anyways, I, I just wanted to add to this that I've read some pretty absurd claims about uh, Ukraine's uh, air defense abilities, including the New York Times just repeating this claim that I believe a person, just you know, one single soldier, firing man pads, shoulder fired air to you know ground to air uh, anti air munitions, took out two Russian cruise missiles, uh, which just seems absolutely absurd and impossible. So now I want to talk about the, the likelihood of nuclear war here. This article by Dave DeCamp at antiwar.com. All right, next up is this article by Dave DeCamp at e antiwar.com. EU warns West will annihilate Russian army if Moscow uses nukes. EU foreign policy chief Joseph Burrell issued a threat against Russia on Thursday, warning that Western powers would annihilate the Russian army if Moscow uses nuclear weapons in Ukraine. Putin is saying he is not bluffing. Well, he cannot afford bluffing, and it has to be clear that people supporting Ukraine and the European Union Union and the member states and the United States and NATO members are not bluffing, Burrell said at a European Diplomatic Academy event in Belgium. Any nuclear attack against Ukraine will create an answer, not a nuclear answer, but such a powerful answer from the military side that Russia's army will be annihilated, he added. The warning from Burrell came as NATO defense ministers held a second day of talks in Brussels, which included closed doors meeting of the alliance's nuclear planning group, the body that sets and reviews NATO nuclear policy. NATO Secretary General Stoltenberg also warned Russia against Ukraine using nuclear weapons, saying if it would have severe consequences, but said the chances of NATO using nuclear weapons are extremely remote. Now, I wrote this article for antiwar.com the next day, and it, you know, very interesting here, compared, you know, kind of what Marcone said uh, to what NATO is saying, and, and then the response to each chapter. And remember, the French President Emmanuel Marcone is one of the few European leaders who has leaned more towards peace than war. You know, France has given Ukraine advanced weapons and things like that. Now, they're certainly a part of this, you know, uh, NATO-led uh, campaign against um, NATO-led campaign against Russia. At this, but at the same time, uh, you know, far more reserved. And Marcon has held far more talks with Putin, you know, be in the lead up to the war and since the war started, than probably any other NATO uh, leader other than Recep. Erdogan, uh, the Turkish leader. So uh, this up, uh, Marcon, France won't respond to a nuclear strike on Ukraine with nuclear weapons. Uh, French President Marcon answered questions about Paris's nuclear weapons policy in a Wednesday television interview. He indicated that Moscow detonating a nuclear weapon in Ukraine would not cause Paris to use its news. Marcon is facing criticism for his remarks. Paris's current nuclear policy only allows for the deployment of its ultimate weapons in self-defense. In the interview, Marcon expressed a nuclear weapon attack on Ukraine would not directly threaten France. On France 2, Marcon was asked, would France consider a tactical nuclear strike by Russian as a nuclear strike? Um... And he replied, France has a nuclear doctrine. It lies in the nation's fundamental interests that are clearly defined. That wouldn't be questioned should there be a ballistic nuclear attack. And so, you know, he's saying that that, that just wouldn't rise to the occasion. Uh, the defense minister of the Netherlands criticized Marcon, saying, part of our de deterrence is also not speculating publicly 
on what kind of response and what kind of situation they would get into. She continued, I would not comment on different possibilities and say yes or no, which is pretty much what Stoltenberg and the other NATO leaders were doing the day before. The Financial Times reported that NATO officials were unwilling to give a public statement on Marcon's remarks. However, speaking privately, they said the alliance policy was not to spell out when nuclear weapons would be used. An official added that conventional strike on Russia was the likely response to Moscow using nuclear weapons in Ukraine. Marcon was also asked by politicians at home, former, uh, was also attacked by politicians at home. Former French President Holland said on France Info Radio, Marcon should say as little as possible and be prepared to do as much as possible. He added, nuclear discussion credibility relies not on saying anything about we would what we would have to do. Uh, the vice president of the National Assembly's Armed Forces Committee issued a sharper rebuke. When I heard him speak, I almost fell out of my chair. It was a political mistake. One of the principles of nuclear discussion is that there is an uncertainty as was considered a vital interest. Marcon tweeted Thursday, we do not want world war. When asked about the president's remarks, Marcon's office says Paris's nuclear policy is not changed. Nuclear disturbance is the prerogative of the head of the state and the appreciation in a given moment of what is necessary to pervert preserve our vital interests and you know it seems that Marcon is just trying to be a little bit more realistic with his nuclear policy here and the NATO members don't like everybody not making threats all the time so a little bit of good news here Kremlin says Russia's goals in Ukraine can be achieved through talks. The Kremlin said that Russia's goals in Ukraine have not changed, but they could be achieved by negotiations. Reuters reported on Thursday, and Dave DeCamp wrote this up for Antiwar.com on October 13th. Uh, he continues, the direction has not changed. The special military operation continues. It continues in order to... Uh, for us to achieve our goals, Kremlin spokesperson Dmitry Peskov said, as quoted by the Russian newspaper, a Russian newspaper. However, we have repeatedly reiterated that we remain open to negotiations to achieve our G objectives. Uh, Peskov added. Peskov's remarks were the latest comments from Russian officials, stressing that they are open to negotiations, although. Ukraine has hardened its stance on peace with Russia after Moscow formally annexed territory it controls in Ukraine. The U.S. has also made it clear that it has no interest in negotiating with Russia over Ukraine, which Peskov recognizes. It takes two sides to have a dialogue. As the West is now taking a very, very hostile stance towards us, it's unlikely there will be any such prospect in the near future, he said. President Biden said this week that he has no intention to meet with Putin and negotiate over Ukraine. The Washington Post reported that U.S. officials have ruled out the idea of pushing the Ukraine to talk with Russia. Uh, next up, Russian officials say Ukraine joining NATO would mean World War III. This is a pretty long-standing Russian position, but you know, just a another note that we're having this reiterated by the Kremlin is important, as Zelensky is seeking to have uh, Kiev's NATO membership fast-tracked and uh, you say, he says that Ukraine is a de facto NATO member. Now, this article I wrote for the Libertarian Institute on October 13th, and I thought was really interesting. And, you know, there's a lot to this; is pretty complicated, and I think you know where the truth lies here is very nuanced. So it's a lot to get into. But uh, Palestinian president rules out U.S. as sole mediator, open to Russia filling role. In a meeting with Russian President Vladimir Putin, Palestinian President Mohammed Abbas said he does not trust Washington to play the re leading role to help resolve the Israeli occupation. Abbas instead voiced support for Moscow, declaring, Ru uh, declaring that Russia stands for justice. Abbas made the statement during remarks at a public meeting with Putin in Kazakhstan on Thursday saying, we don't trust America and you know our position. We don't trust it. We don't rely on it. And under no circumstances can we accept that America is the sole party in resolving the problem. The is Israel-Palestine conflict can only be resolved by the quartet. Uh, Russia, the U.S., United Nations, and European Union, Abbas added, stressing
stressing the importance of Moscow's role. We believe and know that Russia has a clear position on the settlement, and I am absolutely sure it will never change. We know perfectly well that Russia stands for justice for international law. Putin responded favorably and said he hopes to improve ties between Moscow and Ramallah. Russia has a principled stance on the fundamental resolutions of the United Nations, and it remains unchanged, he said. Abbas is 87 years old and was last elected in 2005. While his mandate to its rule expired in 2009, Tel Aviv and Ramallah have prevented new elections since. Israel continues to maintain security control and enforce laws over all territories of historic Palestine, although Abbas and the Palestinian Authority government in Ramallah have some sway in the West Bank, his influence does not extend to the blockaded Gaza Strip, where the Islamist political party and the militant faction Hamas have been in power since 2007. Uh, that's when the, there was the last election in Palestine. However, Ab Abbas's quartet plan appears to be a non-starter. And protests of the ongoing war in Ukraine, many American and European officials are outright refusing to attend any meeting with their Russian counterparts. The sit-down between Putin and Abbas highlights fractures in the West campaign to isolate the Kremlin. After Russia invaded Ukraine in February, President Joe Biden said he would ensure Putin lost his global partners. While many countries have moved to sanction Moscow, it has retained close relationship with larger international partners like Indian and China, and also to smaller actors like the Palestinian Authority. Washington is Tel Aviv's primary sponsor, providing some $3.8 billion in military aid every year. According to several human rights organizations, Israel's hard system of governance over the Palestinian lands violates international law and amounts to apartheid. And so, you know, again, some things here... Abbas doesn't re represent the, the Palestinian people, right? He he leads a pretty corrupt organization in Ramallah that does have some political control that I, I'm sure does have some influence among the Palestinian people. And I'm sure there's a lot of Palestinians who, who are fine with Abbas and who like Fatah and all that. Uh, but in general, you know, the guy hasn't been elected a long time. He's very old, probably pretty out of touch with what's going on. And so I, I don't want this article or what I'm saying here to be misinterpreted as this is how the Palestinian people feel. This is just how a Palestinian politician feels. However, you know, Abbas being ahead of the PA and in this situation is, you know, holding meetings with Putin in in third countries and, you know, saying that Russia is important to resolving this situation, it is an essential actor resolving this situation, I think really cuts against what the U.S. and the West ha have planned to do uh, to Russia in response to the, to the invasion of Ukraine. All right, so last article here today, Saudi Arabia totally rejects U.S. condemnation of OPEC oil cuts. Saudi Arabia on Thursday shot back at the Biden administration for its criticism of OPEC's decision to reduce oil production and said it totally re rejected the U.S. characterization of the move. Biden administration officials have said that Saudi Arabia and other OPEC nations have aligned with Russia by agreeing to cut oil production by 2 million barrels per day, but Saudis reject that notion, saying the move was not political. These outcomes are based purely on economic considerations that will take into account main Maintaining balance of supply and demand in the oil markets, as well as an aim to limit the volatility that does not serve the interests of consumers and producers, as has always been the case with OPEC Plus, the Saudi Foreign Ministry said in a statement. The statement said in consultations on the issue, the Biden administration suggested postponing the oil Per, uh, reduction in production by one month, which could have delayed the rise in gas prices until after the U.S. midterm elections. The Saudi amendment said the delay would have had negative economic consequences. And so, you know, there's so many telling things ab about this story. And the first one is just, you know, how disingenuous Democrats are, uh, particularly on the climate issue, where, you know, not only did they just get done celebrating the bombing of a pipeline, uh, but you know, now they're 
their their main concern here isn't human rights. It's just oil prices, and they want low gas prices before the election. Uh, Saudi Arabia cutting oil production, you would think, would be a great thing because that would mean less carbon produced. But <laughs> that ain't the consideration in the White House. And that you know that they only want to back this up by one month is again so telling. They don't even care about the American people. They just care about their election. The White House responded to Riyadh's statement by again accusing Saudis of helping Russia and warning that the U.S. will reassess its relationship with the kingdom. We are reevaluating our relationship with Saudi Arabia in light of these actions and will continue to look for signs about where they stand in combating Russian aggression, National Security Council spokesperson John Kirby said. Many Democrats in Congress are calling for fundamental change to the relationship with Saudi Arabia after the OPEC decision, including a halt to U.S. military support. Senator Bob Menendez, the head of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee, has called for a complete freeze of U.S. side corporate, uh, cooperation, and um, you know we, we've discussed that on the show in the past. I wrote an article about that earlier in the week. Um, now, I, I guess the last thing I just wanted to mention here was that um, uh, after Dave wrote this article, I think this happened over the weekend, or if not, just in the past day or so, that, uh, you know, quote unquote progressive Congressman Ro Khan uh, made probably the most horrifying statement that I've heard recently, saying that the solution here is actually to transfer the, you know, U.S. military equipment in Saudi Arabia, including the Patriot missile batteries from Saudi Arabia to Ukraine, which I'm pretty sure it would just be a declaration of war with Russia. An insane thing for a congressman to say, but there we have it. Anyways, that's where I'm wrapping up the show for today. Everybody, thank you so much for tuning in. More content later in the week. Uh, Antiwar.com, we have our fundraiser going on, so if you can, head on over and support. Find me at the Libertarian Institute and on Twitter at Kyle Anselm underscore.